Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think we all understand how difficult the decisions are that need to be made these days, and these are not decisions that we ever wanted to make. Sometimes we're probably afraid to know if we're right or wrong. But in any case, I have to ask you a few questions. On the balance sheet of AIG that was submitted earlier this month in their 10-K, the balance sheet showed that AIG had an exposure to the yield curve of $500 billion, which is five times greater than it ever had in equity. At what point is enough enough? Why didn't anybody stop AIG from accumulating that kind of risk and then turning it over to the taxpayers? Well, that's the great question. I mean, under the laws of the land, AIG was allowed to build up through a variety of complex structures huge amounts of risk relative to the capital they were put up in, and there was really no accountable, competent authority overseeing that broad process. And that's what put us to the point where, again, the government had no choice but to come in and try to unwind this in a sort of carefully measured way. Well, if you look at the last 10-Q that Fannie Mae filed, the last 10-Q shows that Fannie Mae accumulated just in the last six months before that 10-Q, from the beginning of last year to the middle of last year, over $250 billion in exposure to derivatives. Again, at what point do people say enough is enough? This is too dangerous for the system to be allowed. Well, but, again, this is not something that I can respond to carefully and thoughtfully without looking at the particular issues in this context. In the times of Fannie and Freddie now, you know, they are very large institutions. They've got a very complicated set of risks they have to hedge. They've got an elaborate risk management framework over them with a much more powerful supervisor now looking over those basic judgments. But I wouldn't infer from looking at that one piece of their 10-K whether that's at risk of leaving. They're designed to make them safer, not more risky. Well, in fact, the total exposure at that point in June of last year for Fannie Mae was over a trillion dollars, about $1.5 trillion of exposure to derivative. Is it fair to say that that contributed to its failure? And if so, at what point should someone have said enough is enough? Again, Fannie and Freddie were also not under a appropriately sophisticated oversight framework with adequate powers prior to the legislation Congress passed last summer. So, but again, you don't think you can measure the risk in their exposure by looking at that piece of the balance sheet. If one's priority at this point were to say there should be no more need for taxpayer bailouts, that the way to deal with systemic risk is to prevent that risk from happening in the first place, what kind of substantive rules would you see being imposed on these kinds of institutions to prevent the taxpayer from being on the hook? That is all our objective. Again, the most simple way to frame it is capital, capital, capital. Capital sets the amount of risk you can take overall. Capital ensures you have big enough to absorb extreme shocks. You want capital requirements to be designed so that given how uncertain we are about the future of the world, given how much ignorance we fundamentally have about some elements of risk, that there is a much greater cushion to absorb loss and to save us from the consequence of mistakes in judgment and uncertainty in the world. That is the, in a simple way, that's the best solution to these things. And that is not going to be something the market's going to provide on its own. That's something we have to impose through standards set in regulation. Is it fair to say that if an organization like AIG had been subject to margin calls, things never would have gotten as far along as they did and we wouldn't have had this kind of exposure today? I'm not quite sure that's fair, but you're right. You want to make sure that the margin regime, too, margins like capital, just to use a simple thing, you want to make sure that institutions like AIG hold much more capital against the risk they're underwriting and are exposed to. And you want to have, in derivatives in particular, you want to have a margin regime that is also much more conservative. Give us some idea of the substantive rules that you see being put in place for, let's say, hedge funds, if hedge funds reach the size of posing systemic risk. If an entity that is not now a bank were to rise to the point in the future where because of its structure, because of how connected it is to the system, because of its relationships and role in these markets, it could pose systemic risk, then in our judgment, they should be brought within a framework similar to what we're going to impose on large, complex, regulated financial institutions. And that means a fully elaborated set of capital requirements, requirements on liquidity, on risk management, that are applied and enforced on a consolidated basis by a competent authority. And does enforcement really mean that at some point somebody's going to say to an institution like AIG, enough is enough? Absolutely. That's what the great virtue of a capital requirement is it does constrain the amount of risk you can take. 
And the great virtue of the elaborate structure we have in place for banks in Fiducia is it forces intervention if they get to the point where capital is. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. 